This week on A Lively Experiment, the saga surrounding the closure of the Washington Bridge continues. We'll have the latest developments from this week. And it's a steep price tag to restore pension cuts for state workers. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazenwhite, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program in Rhode Island PBS. Joining us on the panel, attorney and legal analyst Lou Polner. Sue Sienke, former chair and national committee woman for the Rhode Island Republican Party. And the public's radio political reporter, Ian Donis. Hello and welcome to Lively. I'm Jim Hummel and we appreciate your spending part of your weekend with us. The top administrator for the Federal Highway Administration came to Rhode Island to see the Washington Bridge for himself. And he may have tipped his hand on what many of us have been thinking, saying the westbound side of the bridge may need a total rebuild, and if that's the case, it could take a year or two. Ian, you were along for the press gaggle. What did you take out of that day when he was here? I think you had the headline right there, Jim, that the administrator said he was here because of the possibility that the bridge might need to be replaced. He would not have come if it was only a repair situation. And we don't know for sure right now, but more engineering information is expected either later this month or early in March. And, you know, the bad news about that is if it needs to be a total rebuild, the impact on traffic will not be worse than it is right now. But the bad news is that on days when there's a traffic accident or something, uh, there's it's a terrible backup and 195 becomes a parking lot. You and I are East Bay guys and we have a little bit of flexibility of schedule, but you feel for the people who have to be there at a certain time and going each way. Yeah, and there have been a lot of ripple effects. I mean, my wife works near Rodan Hospital trying to get out of that area in Providence each day, even if there's not a traffic accident, is very difficult. There's a lot of congestion. There's just been a wide ranging ripple effect. So commuting times for a lot of people are taking considerably longer than it usually does. It's a major, you know, it's a major highway um, coming from Massachusetts to try to get into Providence. So I, I agree with Ian. It's going to have a ripple effect on businesses, on people's personal lives, on their work schedules. It's quite a disaster. But are we going to be able to hold anybody accountable for what has happened? You know, we've seen instances where inspections happen and nobody holds anybody accountable. It happened with the station fire and 100 lives were lost. If this bridge had collapsed, mm. it would have been disastrous. But nobody was held accountable. And I know that there have been several APRA requests to see how long these inspection reports have been ignored. And some of these reports go back to 2012, mm. which was when Link Chafee was the governor. So every governor after that has ignored these problems or has not been informed of the, the, the real $64,000 question is you say Sue is how did the bridge come into such disrepair if it was inspected last summer and found to be okay and how could it be if there was evidence of decay that was not evident until recently how do you how do you do an inspection yeah <clears throat> uh, the problem I see is is that we have a large gas tax here in the state of Rhode Island, and it's supposed to be dedicated to roads and bridges, and it goes into the general fund, and here we are today. Yeah, I think anybody that lives on the East Bay is really in trouble because now the reports are coming out that Mount Hope Bay is going to go. Yeah, the Mount Hope Bridge. Mount Hope Down Bridge, to one lane. Beautiful. Down to one lane. It's, so it's only two lanes. It's, it's only a, two lanes, it's, right. It's, so it's, to get off the <laughs> island to try to even go down to Newport and access a 95 that way, they are really hamstrung. The Braga Bridge better hold up, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> one other aspect of this is that the, change, the situation changes a lot from day to day. And I know businesses in East Providence are concerned that people have an exaggerated view on what traffic is like there every day. I mean, yes, at, at rush hour, the highway is congested, but I did an interview at a flower shop right by the highway in East Providence this week, and you can go up and down Taunton Avenue, no problem. So I think businesses want to get the word out that, you know, the city is not uh, gridlocked by traffic um, outside of, you know, some more limited times. So this week we're taping on a Thursday afternoon. We usually tape Friday morning. And Thursday afternoon, any of you who are in it, if there, or Thursday morning, there were, there were car accidents on each side. And it shows you the window, 
of uh, margin for error is very, very small. And that was an hour, some people coming in. So you think even in the best of times going through, I don't think the governor does himself any favors, though, trying to minimize it. I think you should get on board and say, we feel your pain. Yeah, you know, the problem is people are bumper to bumper, bumper to bumper, which lends itself to wanting to look at your phone. And when you look at your phone, that's when an accident happens, right. bumper to bumper to bumper. And it's a chain reaction. And yeah. Right. And I should say, coming in this afternoon, it took me 20 minutes. It was no problem. But that's the middle of the afternoon on a weekday with no accidents. Right. And I think people are calling their bosses to say, hey, I am stuck in traffic. There has been an accident. I'm not going to be there in 15 minutes. It's going to take 30 minutes. And that only adds to the problem if they get distracted. But you think of the unintended consequences like Bayview. I, I heard a woman on a radio say she's, she lives in Cranston. Her kids go to school in Dartmouth. She's pulling the kids. Right. She said, I can't do this every day. You talked to uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Ryan Pearson, for your roundtable this week. Did he talk at all about what they were expecting out of the oversight hearings? Those begin on Monday. Right. I asked if he was going to sit in on that in his ex officio capacity. He said he does not expect to. And he was really holding his, withholding his judgment on the bridge until there are more findings from that oversight process. Uh, Pearson is from Cumberland, the hometown of Governor McKee, and I tried to get some answers out of him on how locals in Cumberland are viewing the governor in light of the bridge episode. And, and Pearson did he was, take the bait? It, not really. He was pretty <laughs> re reticent to get into that. But you know, clearly, uh, no one likes being stuck in traffic. Hey, you don't get to be majority leader without being able to blow off Ian Donis a few times here and there. Um, what would you like to hear? Should we, do you have expectations that the, it's a joint House and Senate oversight hearing, Lou? What would you like them to ask? If you were sitting there, what would you like to hear? Who's responsible for missing all those reports and inspections? Uh, but it's not really going to matter. But what happens, worst case scenario, Alvidi gets fired. The governor's ratings go down even more. But really, what's the upshot? We, we're, we're stuck in this quagmire, and it's going to be a year, two years. And this being Rhode Island, I expect it to Three be full. Yeah. yeah, I just don't expect it to be that quick. And I'm glad I don't live on the East Bay. When the highway administrator said it would take a year or two years to fix the bridge, I thought about the, uh, what is it, the Warrington, the Warren, the Barrington Bridge, Bristol yeah, Bridge. 14 years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I will say some of that was, I thought about that too, Ian. That Shire really got the bad, and they were painted as the bad guys. And I remember talking to the head of Shire, Mr. Gamino, and they held their they held their peace for a long time. And then he finally spoke to me. A lot of that was faulty designs by the DOT, and, and right. that's why it went 14 years. They made it sound like it was the contractor's fault. The state gave them the wrong specs. Well, and you wonder if that's the problem here with the Washington Bridge. Was it a faulty design to begin with so that nothing that they did in terms of maintenance was going to fix the design problem? So going forward, you, you asked Lou, what would he like to see? Would I would you? like to see a design that is actually works and that is is appropriate for the area that we live in. I mean, you talk about two years. Well, we have to deal with weather here. I mean, today's a beautiful day, but we live in an area where you do get snowfall, where it's cold and things happen. So let's make sure that we have the right design. I got nothing else to offer. It's just a horrible situation. Come live with me for a week. <clears throat> no. You could talk the whole half hour. Not a chance. But it's such a, <laughs> it's such a Rhode Island thing. Well, that's a, it just keeps rolling around my brain. You know. This is Rhode Island. You know, it's interesting. Adam Myers, we had on last week, the um, uh, BC professor, he said he wonders whether this is going to bleed. At first, I, I said it's good it's not an election year because if it was this fall, that would be tr problematic. But this could go on but into would it, the 26th. Would it? I mean, people get aggravated and they complain and they still elect the same people over and over again. Yeah. So we can sit here and say this is aggravating, this is awful, how did this happen? No one ever gets held accountable and we elect the same people over and over again. So I, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe if the bridge collapsed, then people would have been aggravated. Well, then there would be criminal indictments. It, there would, maybe, you know, who knows what would have happened. Um, Finally, what, what did you, what sense have you gotten from reporting on this that we're going to, at what point are they going to figure out what the plan is? I is that fluid? 
I think it'll come after the additional engineering information either later this month or in early March. I asked uh, Governor McKee this week if there was any update on when that information will be released. He said that's still the timeline they expect. So I, I think that'll shed light on whether it's a total replacement or whether they can salvage the current bridge. Okay. State Treasurer James Diosa has been uh, convening a pension uh, advisory group. This goes back to Gina Raimondo's time as treasurer when they did a lot of pension reform. It took the COLAs, the cost of living adjustment, away for a lot of retirees. And now they want to revisit this. Sue, what struck me this week is that um, Kathy Gregg, you know, the, it sounds great until you see what the price tag might be. Yeah, the numbers are too outrageous. $50 million to $160 million and maybe more from there. So while you feel for some of these retirees, some of them don't collect Social Security, um, not everybody has the big headline of that Providence firefighter. You wonder whether there's going to be any appetite given where the budget is heading in the years Yeah, I don't ahead. think there's going to be any appetite in the near term future. Um, I think it's way too expensive. I think that they just don't have the money. Um, I think that every city and town has to look at their municipal contracts, anybody in that MERS system. You have to really pay attention. What are you promising these retirees that you will not be able to sustain in the long term? long run. Because you don't want to take it away from them. You don't again. want to take it away from them, but you you really have to pay attention to what you're offering them and be honest with them. You know, we can't offer you this great pension anymore because it's just not sustainable. It's not fair to look at a retiree that turns 65 and then cannot really go out and get another job um, and say, oh, we promised you X amount, but we're not going to be able to give that to you anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just not, you're on a limited uh, income. It's just not fair. They got screwed, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. And again, that's like another only in Rhode Island type of a story. But the fact is, is they got really hammered and not getting colas when the inflation is what it is right now. Uh, it's unfortunate. And, you know, when it wasn't their fault, it was all the giveaways by previous politicians. And I think that's just it. it, and, it, it and back then. A lot of people left the private sector to go to the public sector because good, you know, the pay might have been a little less. Now the pay is caught up dramatically, but the pension was always good and you could count on it. And, and a lot of people and, left for that. And family blue cross. Yes. I mean, for life in yeah, some cases. Yeah. These retirees are sympathetic figures. I think at the same time, we can see how there have been a couple of candidates who've tried running on the anger of the retirees. Matt Brown did that in 2018 when he tried taking on Raimondo. Spencer Dickinson did that when he ran for Congress. And this has not really been an issue that has galvanized broad political support. Port. So that, I think, combined with the huge price tag, makes it questionable whether these retirees will get much more, much of anything from the legislature. They should have gotten something f f from the COVID money, mm -hmm. even if it was just a lump sum a payment. A one time, yeah. And they, I mean, you're given $3,000 to this one, you're given $3,000 to that one. Uh, remember the, the giveaway that the, that the governor did? Uh, those retirees should have and, gotten. And we're, we're, we spent $250 million, which still has not been spent, but allocated for housing. They want another $100 million. Couldn't you carve a little bit out of that? Because that, that, there's always going to be the housing crisis. The throwaways. Uh, you know, just like Lou said, it, they don't matter to these politicians. They don't matter. They don't have any juice to force the politicians to, to actually give them anything. It's interesting to me. What what is your sense of what drove this? The legislature kind of leaned on the treasurer to, to form this committee. Did he do this on his own, or do you think that really emanated from the um, or originated in the General Assembly? Yeah, I think it came from the legislature. I think um, these retirees kind of ginned up support. Uh, Pat Serpa, the a rep from West Warwick became outspoken on behalf of the retirees. A couple of other reps have sounded off on the issue. So I think getting DOSA to do a study commission was a way of kind of diverting the issue in the short term while they try and figure out a game plan. Pat Serpa is amazingly candid at times. She'll say, if I had known this, what I know now, I never would have voted for it. And I'm like, well, I think a lot of people kind of think that, but they never they never say it. Um, another proposal before the General Assembly involves um, having magistrates. Well, actually, you know what? We're going to go to Lou to set us up on this. You have judges and you have magistrates. Magistrates get appointed. They don't have to go through the normal vetting process. And now the chief judge of the family court, Mike Fort, is saying we'd like magistrates to be able to hear contested divorce cases, which are pretty complex and you have to make some big decisions. But the magistrates 
are, are, are quality quality jurists. They not, really are not casting any aspersions. And, on and, them. and I say that because I don't I didn't like the process either. I mean, avoiding or skirting uh, the judicial nominating committee uh, just it, it doesn't it doesn't pass the smell test. Started about thirty years ago, maybe twenty five. Yeah, Bill McAtee was one of the first ones. He was a former state rep, and yeah. I remember he was a magistrate. Yeah, and uh, the, the the reality is is that uh, if you put uh, common Cause <coughs> and John Marion aside, because every argument he makes is legitimate. Mm. Uh, the fact is, is that the magistrates uh, are, are, are damn good, and they, no doubt in my mind, they could do contested trials. The question is, is whether or not, again, it passes the smell test. But do we need to look at the overall, the magistrates have grown. Is that a good thing, or, or should there be judges... I mean, it almost seems like an end around to get more judges on the bench. Well, it, it is. Uh, they started out with one or two, and now I think we've got 10 or 12. Uh, but the fact is, is that the family court's a very busy court. Right. I mean, people like to get divorced and remarried, and it just, it's a vicious cycle. It keeps some lawyers in business, it, doesn't it? It does, it does, it does. And the fact is, is that... Uh, yeah. Bottom line, I'd like to see them be able to handle trials. I think it would ease the calendar. I mean, right now you can wait up to a year to get a trial, but if you allowed the magistrates to handle that some of that caseload, I think it would move things a lot faster. We have another attorney on this uh, panel. Yeah, I think that what they did with the Judicial Nominating Commission was a huge improvement to what they had before. Um, from an outside perspective, people that are not lawyers, it looks like they're making an unrend and run around the mm. process, which doesn't pass the smell test. But I agree with Lou. I mean, anybody that becomes a magistrate is probably more than qualified to become a judge. So do you need more judges then to handle what's happening in, in particular in family court? But the difference here is that once you're a judge, you're a judge for life. Right. And when you're ten a magistrate, years. you're in there for 10 years. Has anybody yeah. been yanked after 10 years? Uh, very few. Very few. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, I mean, I know magistrates that have been uh, re-upped for three, four terms already. Right. So 30, and 40 finished out the string. <laughs> the, the Judicial Nominating Commission has improved the process. It was intended to lessen the political influence. But let's face it, you can't take the politics out of what is inherently a political process. And I think you do have to be wary of mission creep for people who have not been vetted through the JNC. But yeah, the and it used to be... Go ahead. I was going to say, the Judicial Nominating Committee, though, is, you know, <laughs> it's... The speaker gets a pick to see if one goes on. The Senate president gets a pick. The governor gets two picks. So, I mean, it, it's, it's completely political. And trust me, the, these legislators uh, that I just mentioned, they have their thumbs on the scale. But yeah, it's, it's way better, I think, in my uh, professional opinion, than having judges that are elected. Because I think oh, that, that's a that whole other, is a whole other thing. And then and, how do you take campaign contributions right. and all you know, of that? I, in New York, they elect judges. So I lived through that process. I also lived in Maryland where anybody that went before a judicial nominating committee, they actually sent surveys to every member of the bar. Have you had experience with this person? How do you feel about it? And, and I thought that level was way better than what we do in Rhode Island because people that actually worked with them got to say, they were very good attorneys. I mean, if you were a litigator. They saw them in the, in the trenches. They, they saw them in the trenches. What I was just going to say is the entire Supreme Court of Colorado that is trying to throw Trump off the, the ballot, uh, they were all appointed or, or elected. They just, no, they were appointed. Yeah, but, but years ago, what has it been, Lou, 25, 30 years ago, they used to pick them right out of their General Assembly seat. And when the Supreme Court had an opening, it was the Grand Committee which was basically in the House. So you look at who was on the Supreme Court 30 years ago. Again, not besmirching their, their legal abilities, but it makes you think you really have to kind of, you have to go to LaSalle, PC, and Suffolk Knights Law School, and then you're all, you're ticketed to be able to get a judge. Shepherd. Then you get the seat. How long has that been since the um, Judicial Nominating Committee? Has it been 25 years, maybe? I bet you at least that, yeah. Okay. The ACLU came up with a, this is actually, was happening last week, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. The ACLU did a survey on the public's being able to weigh in at uh, 
public meetings, school committees, town councils. I found this really interesting, Ian. I mean, we're particularly interested in this because, you know, open records, APRA, this is something that I don't think a lot of people know, that in some communities, they don't even allow you time. You know, we'll get to you in East Greenwich. A lot of people weigh in in East Greenwich. But there's some communities where you can't, even if you want to, you can't say anything during the meeting. It's outrageous. Yeah, this was a real eye-opening finding. And I remember, I remember years ago, Access RI promoted efforts to try and, you know, get a police log just by some unknown person who goes into a police department and asks to see it. And a lot of times there are real pressure points for these opportunities for the public to weigh in or get information. We see how their new proposals being made this week to improve the state's access to Public Records Act. And there's a constant push and pull between the public's right to know and government's ability or government's attempts to limit that. And this is a piece of that. What was it like in EG? So it's interesting because when I was first elected to the school board, we used to have public comment for anything that wasn't on the agenda in the first 15 minutes of our meeting. And then at the end, we would have public comment on things that were on the agenda, which I thought was crazy. I said, people that take their time to come to a meeting and have something to say, put the public comment first, um, and then give them the opportunity, if there's something on the agenda, to speak. And I thought that that worked well. Um, interesting enough, then when I was on the town council, we always had public comment, and we would put a time limit, we would say 15 minutes, but anybody that came to that meeting that wanted to speak, I let them speak right. because they took the time out and you had to be able to hear what the constituents said. Is that the same now? No. Uh, we have a building project going on in East Greenwich. They don't allow public comment. Um, and I think that's outrageous. Who's paying for those buildings ultimately? Yes. Yeah. Everybody in the state because, exactly. uh, you know, it's taxpayers that are paying for it, but everybody in the state because RIDE has put these incentives in. But you should be able to question and ask questions. And as an elected official, if you really believe that the decision that you're making is in the best interest of your city or town, why can't you ask questions? Well, that would require transparency. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah, what I don't get is some lawyer, and I don't know when this happened, Ian, maybe we w woke up one day and all of a sudden the lawyers were advising, you can't speak, you can't answer back. Well, and that was why pa is Patrick that? Lynch when he was the attorney general. I mean, it was when I was on the school committee, they said, people can come and ask you questions. You but are you not, have to be you can't answer them. Why? And he said, because it would uh, it would violate the Open Meetings Act. So we actually negotiated or talked to him and said, listen, if somebody comes and asks us a question, we can answer them for information purposes. Sure. We're not voting on it. It shouldn't violate the Open Meetings Act. So he actually relaxed any open meeting violation if anybody came. But for the first year or two, we would sit there and people would ask us questions and we're like, we can't answer them. But the word went, and that chilling effect, I think, from that administration, I think Peter Nerona's tried, P Peter Kamart was a disaster, but Peter uh, uh, Nerona has really worked hard on APRA, but I just think the onus is so against the public and reporters and everybody else. It's the law of... Um, it's the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you found that too in covering meetings that they don't want to talk? They don't want to engage with the public. It's funny because, you know, here in Rhode Island, we have great access to uh, politicians. They expect to interact with obnoxious reporters like <laughs> you and me or political activists like Sue. And, but I mean, this is at a real variance with that kind of thing. I mean, what is the big deal about giving the public an opportunity to speak at a public, it is a, a public meeting after all, so yeah. And interesting enough, I know that Ian had indicated this, that there is legislation up there that Representative Newberry and the entire Republican caucus has put in to really gain more access to access for public records. I mean, even the Washington Bridge, when I think it was Ted Nisi had requested some information and they were going to charge him $300. And then there's the instance of a mother, Nicole Solis, down in South Kingstown that asked for the curriculum and they wanted to charge her over $70,000. Um, that's not transparency. And maybe, you know, what they did in Hawaii, which putting, you know, in one place all these public documents that anybody from the public can go in and look at it maybe that is a good everybody solution. should go to florida and get a and get a primer on the sunshine state really is in terms of open records just briefly your reaction when the dot charged multiple outlets different prices yeah, for that, for, I, the, was, for the it, records, the yeah, emails. Yeah, it was bad. It was really excessive. And I, I, you know, I think Governor McKee made the right move by 
calling for many, most of those charges to be rescinded. One bright spot is that we actually compare well to Massachusetts, which oddly for what is seen as a progressive state is very uh, reactionary and very limited in its approach to public records. And you're going to be covering, there's some APRA stuff going on this week that you'll be writing about. Yes, on Thursday, uh, Democratic lawmakers are unveiling their proposal for improving the state's access to public records act. Great. Let's go to uh, outrages and or kudos. Counselor, what do you have? Governor McKee, uh, I know he's working really hard to do the best job he can, but you mentioned it, I don't know if it was out here or in the green room, he minimizes the, the amount of traffic and the amount of time it takes to commute from the East Bay to Providence. And I think he said it was only 10 or 15 minutes each way. We have to get through this. It's not a big deal. And I heard Matt Allen say, yeah, maybe, because he had his trooper who drives him, time it and measure it. And Matt Allen said, yeah, but you know, that's because you had lights and sirens. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. the reality is, is he doubled down on that same time frame uh, just a few days ago. And I don't think that does him uh, any good. It's like Gordon Fox used to say, yeah, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Mm. So what do you have? So I want to uh, commend the Republican caucus up at the State House, continually asking for an inspector general. I think it would be great. It would be, handle a lot of the issues that we had to find waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, you, you've seen not only the Washington Bridge, but what happened at St. Mary's home that mm. says restoring lives and gaining hope. I don't know who they're restoring lives and gaining hope for. That is another it's a chilling out story. It is outrageous, and not enough people know about that. Um, the UHIP that happened uh, several years ago, these are areas that I think an inspector general, and they have gotten Democratic buy in for this. I think it, it would be great. But it's pretty clear the leadership doesn't want the camel nose under the tent. Yeah, but it, right? would, be, it would be a welcome addition in Rhode Island. And you wonder if a, an inspector general was in place. And let's say, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people coming out of the woodwork with DOT. Hey, you should look here or look there. If that was in place and there was somebody, you know, maybe not criminal, maybe not the auditor general, to go to whether some of this would have been exposed years well, it, ago. And it's interesting, speaking to several of the other states and speaking to IGs in several of the 44 other states that have an inspector general, it really does reduce the size of government, too. I think you'll look at some of these areas, DHS, which is really administratively top-heavy. So when you look at the situation with St. Mary's, um, would they have? Would that have happened if we had the right people in place rather than heavy in an administration? You get the last minute. I visited an old college friend in New Jersey recently, uh, got off the Garden State Parkway. There was a toll plaza that did not appear to be staffed. You had to have exact change for the dollar five cent toll or else uh, evade the toll. And I expected, like usually with Easy Pass in most states, and I don't have an Easy Pass, you know, you just, they read your plate and you get billed for it. So I expect, you know, maybe like a $5 fee. I was hit with a $50 administrative fee for a oh dollar five cent oh. toll. Uh, Tony Soprano and Raymond <laughs> L.S. Patriarca would envy that rate of increase. I thought it was outrageous. This was challenged a couple of years ago in Superior Court in New Jersey. The judge found that it was a reasonable cost. I think that's outrageous. That is oh. reasonable. <laughs> that is crazy. All right, folks, that is all the time we have. Lou and Ian and Sue, good to see you. Folks, come by here next week. If you don't catch us Friday at 7 or Sunday at noon, we archive all of our shows at ripbs.org slash lively. We hope you have a great week. Come back here next week as the Lively Experiment continues. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.